Hey, all, welcome to the Managing with Mind and Heart podcast. I am Michael Nash, and I am Ethan Nash. Not really. We've had lots of comments that we sound the same. I tricked you there. It's really just me today. I hope you tuned in recently and heard Ethan's Gollum imitation. That was, that was pretty funny. We are going to continue today talking about managing remotely. Uh, it was really wonderful to have Anna as our guest recently, and we spent some time talking about the first part of the top 15 management skills, focused specifically on showing caring and respect. We're going to spend some more time on that today, but today we're going to move on to one of the other of our top 15 management skills. Uh, number three on the list, you may recall, says communicate. We're going to spend some time today talking about both the challenges and the strategies for communicating in the remote work setting. For a lot of folks, this is not new. For a lot of our clients and a lot of people that are listening, I'm assuming, you've been doing remote uh, management and remote teaming for years, for, for a long, long time. But for a lot of us right now in this current uh, COVID-19 crisis that we're in, this is a brand new thing, and that's why we're spending some extra time during these podcasts focusing on how to uh, adjust, how to, how to work with managers and employees and teams and groups in a remote setting. Today, we're going to be spending time talking about the challenges of communication. I'll tell you right now that in the best of times, communication in the organization is a challenge. Uh, we have seen uh, hundreds of employee surveys over the last 25 years. And I am pretty sure, I haven't really gone in and studied this, but I am pretty sure that in the top three needs improvements, always, and I'm not using hyperbole, I think it's always, communication always comes up in employee surveys as something that they're frustrated about, something that's not really working very well. We spend a fair amount of time when we're doing our trainings and working with our coaching clients and doing our classes, helping organizations improve communication. For example, we talk about the need for managers to become information curators. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today as we go into this. Uh, it's your job as a manager, uh, among other things. It's your job that your employees know what they need to know. It's your job that you keep them informed. It's your job that you don't create roadblocks for them by not sharing information. And this is really, really tricky. There's, there's uh, lots of different personalities and behavior styles. Uh, some uh, employees aren't going to be excited about accessing email or they're not going to want to come to a meeting or they're not going to be checking their phones. And we have to figure out a way to make this work. I'd like to introduce you to an old friend of mine. Uh, Eric Ummel is joining us today, and he's, he's our guest. Say hi, Eric. Well, hey, Mike. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you being here. I, would you mind, Eric, giving just a little bit of background as to how you and I have connected? <laughs> let's, let, let's share with our audience how I know you, how you know me. Yeah, Mike, thanks again for having me today. Um, you and I met as teenagers. We were back in the same church youth group. Uh, for those of you don't, who don't know, Mike is an excellent musician, uh, one of the pianists in our church, and a good friend of my brother, Scott, who works uh, for Nash Consulting. And uh, so I've tracked with Mike for a lot of years, and it's been a, a pleasure to uh, reconnect. Yeah, I, I agree. It's been it's been really fun to get back in touch with you, Eric. I have really fond memories of you back when I was in the church world, and you were too. We um, were in youth group together, and if I remember, you're a guitarist and you sing. Am I am I remembering that right? That's correct. I didn't play a lot of guitar uh, when you and I knew each other as young teenagers, but I've played for now now for about thirty years. Tell tell me more about the music. Are you are you playing with a group? Or yeah, I played. Uh, I've, I played a lot when my kids were young, and the short story on that, Mike, is that uh, I played with my kids. So my son is an excellent percussionist. My daughter uh, picked up a microphone when she's about eight years old and played. I built out a music room and a small studio in my home, and we played music together three or four nights a week. And uh, my daughter ended up studying at the Berklee College of Music. She's a, a turned into a recording artist for a period of time, ha, was a starving musician in L.A. for a couple of years, and uh, you can find her music music out on iTunes and, and elsewhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised. This is awesome. I can't <laughs> check it out. Yeah. That's really cool. Definitely. Cool. Hey, um, 
I want to ask you a couple of questions just to kind of warm us up. But before that, would you share a little bit about your professional uh, journey and uh, I guess in general, kind of what you bring to the table in terms of helping our audience understand more about remote managing and communication, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. You know, what I bring to the table, I think first and foremost are some fantastic professional models. I'll talk a little bit today about some of the people I've had the privilege of working with and for who have modeled really best practices around communication in large, complex organizations. And I've done my best to try to adopt as many of those best practices as possible. We all know anyone who leads and, and operates in, in large organizations or, or small how critical communication is, and I think we're constantly humbled by uh, the the continual effort to to meet needs and to to uh, align with best practices. You know, beyond that, um, I've had the privilege of working for some great companies over the thir- my 30 year career. I spent the first seven years with the Boeing company, not in leadership roles, but certainly understanding how to survive a, a large organization and really the preeminent manufacturing organization in the world. And then I transitioned to insurance. I worked for Safeco Insurance, a local Seattle company that was uh, acquired in 2008 by Liberty Mutual, now a global behemoth. And so I was involved in uh, lots of different kind of communication uh, challenges, uh, being an acquired company, joining a new culture, uh, being a multinational company. Um, and, and so those were really formative experiences. And uh, most recently, uh, I joined one of the AAA insurance companies, CSAA Insurance Group in Walnut Creek, California where I'm the executive vice, executive vice president uh, for commercial insurance. Wow, that's awesome. I am excited about picking your brain on all this today. You bring a wealth of experience, Eric. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, for- Mike. Hey, um, let's, let's, before we get into it, just to kind of acclimate and get into this sort of gently, um, we are in the middle of a really crazy time. And we're, I'm, in, I'm near Seattle. Eric, you're down in California. Um, are you guys, we're all doing the shelter in place thing right now. Absolutely. Yes. It, you know, with, with the COVID-19, it's, it's yeah. just a, it's a new paradigm. It's, it's, it's going to shift the way we do business, I think, forever. I think there's a lot of change happening right now. On a personal note, let's just take a minute, if you don't mind, Eric. What are you, what are you doing right now personally for yourself to help you stay sane and healthy mm-hmm. and happy during this, during this crazy time? Yeah, that's a, that is a great question. I think it is the question probably for everyone uh, that'll listen to this podcast and, and uh, certainly for people in the United States and, and the world. Mm-hmm. You know, for me, and pers- personally, I think it's been um, really important to kind of triage my own situation with my family. And so I've got a couple of kids, 30 and 31. One lives here in San Francisco and the other in Seattle. I had a dad in an assisted living home in, in Seattle that uh, I was able to kind of migrate uh, to a better situation for him right now. But I think it's that kind of triage process that goes through what are the kind of critical uh, things I need to kind of uh, pay attention to in, in the, the world right around me, my immediate Uh, responsibilities and priorities, and then kind of take in the world uh, and and make sure that I understand what's going on around me. From a really personal standpoint, it's been important for me to just um, double down on some some of my own personal best practices, if you will. I've I've had a a five or seven year uh, experience with uh, yoga. Hmm. I have I've had a pretty consistent practice. Uh, can't go to the yoga studio these days, um, but I, I have a mature enough practice that I can um, do that on my own quite easily. And so I've been combining uh, music and uh, my yoga practice. It's been really important for me just to kind of keep myself active and, and grounded uh, and, um, and also just reconnecting with friends. And so a lot of times we let the intervals extend between talking with valued friends and former colleagues. And so we've found a way to pick up the phone at closer intervals, check in on each other. And that's been really meaningful as well. Oh, that's nice. I, I'm super curious about the yoga. I just started like, like literally in the last 30 days. And, um, I, I'm a, I'm a newbie and I, I don't, I'm not good at it. I'd love to pick your brain about that someday. Absolutely. Look forward to it. I'm, I'm, I think for me, I'm, uh, I, I love the way you said that kind of personal best practices. It's, it's stuff that I kind of would hope I'd be doing 
anyways, but it's like, uh, let's, let's really make sure that I'm focusing on these things. It's, it's, it's more important now than ever, I think, to be healthy and happy and, and peaceful and centered. Um, I've, I've got a meditation practice. We talked a little bit about that on this program. Um, that's just kind of changed my life and, and helped me to you know, be healthier than I think I've ever been. And I'm trying to stay healthy physically. Um, I don't, because I travel so much, it's just been really hard to get into any kind of routine. And it's been actually kind of nice to be home and get, get to go running every day and stay healthy in that way. And then I just want to concur with you. I feel like it's, it, I, I, that my priorities have kind of realigned in terms of connecting. Um, I'm, I'm right. actually, I think I'm talking with my family as a group, all four kids and my wife and I more often now than we were before. And touching bases with some of my friends, including some of those people that I have kind of lost contact with. So that's been really good to kind of be, be a community and be reminded how important that is. I agree. That's great. Well, Eric, we are uh, talking about, uh, in general, the top 15 management skills. And that's a, a topic that we spend a lot of time on in our live trainings. And our, our goal, of course, is to help managers not suck at being managers. And, and that means helping, helping managers learn how to really practically practice these research-based top 15 management skills. Uh, we spent some time previously uh, with another guest, one of our consultants, talking about caring and respect. Um, we're going to skip down to number three today and talk about communication. I want to I want to take a little bit of a wider lens, though, and just ask you this, Eric. In general, um, in a remote situation, let's just talk for a few minutes about what do employees need maybe now more than ever, you know, in a remote situation versus in a live situation, what would you think would be some of the things that we as managers really need to be intentional about for those employees that we're not able to see live in the office every day? Yeah, I think a lot about that because even as leaders, we have our own needs. So I think that the empathy starts with kind of understanding our own experience and make sure, making sure that, um, that we do our best to understand how people on the receiving end, a, a teammate, a peer, a direct report might be feeling as well and, and doing as much as we can to fill those gaps. One of the things I've noticed is how important nonverbal communication is when you're in the office every day. And I typically have been, um, whether it's uh, greeting someone in a hallway or uh, peeking your head in an office or a cubicle or in a conference meeting, we're constantly kind of consuming, taking in, translating, interpreting nonverbal communication. And I think it's startling when you kind of transition to a fully virtual environment, how much you feel like you're flying blind in that way. You're lacking some essential context that you've gotten accustomed to. I think the other part of that is uh, how much we all use uh, nonverbal communication. And so one of the things I've been mindful of, even as I've tried to interpret messages from my boss or from uh, another colleague, is that people might be trying to interpret my own tone or context. And so I think that there are opportunities uh, to seek input and I think to communicate with directness and transparency. I found my saying, myself saying to a colleague, tell me more of that, about that. I want to make sure that I understand um, you know, where you're coming from or how you're feeling, not in a threatening way, but just kind of filling in those gaps for myself. And then as a communicator, as a leader, making sure that um, as I'm mindful of, of ways that I might have otherwise communicated nonverbally, that I fill in those gaps, that I provide that context and communication. It can feel like over-indexing, but it probably, it probably settles into the, the mark, I think, if we do over-index on that. I love where you're going with this, Eric. I, let, let me take a step back and, and the, the word communication. You know, we talk about communication in this particular context within the top 15 management skills. We're talking about general information distribution, and, and we'll, we'll spend time on that today for sure. But you're talking about interpersonal communication, which I wasn't planning on going here, but I actually really want to go here. I, I love what you just said. I, I, let's take a few more minutes and talk about this because you're talking about the barriers that are now in place that aren't in place when we're live. I love right. the way you said that, you know, walking into someone's office and poking our head and saying hi or 
you know, those, those open door policy kind of situations and running into someone in the hallway, the body language, all that stuff is so important. I don't mm-hmm. know how many times I've misinterpreted an email or a text. Right. I've, I've misread the tone or I've had my own emails misinterpreted. And I think what I'm hearing you say is we really have to be even more intentional than ever to make sure that we're being understood and that, well, what do they say about communication? Like 70% of it is body language and tone. Is that, right. that ring a bell? It does. Yeah. And I think that's, that's precisely the point. And I think uh, it, it really was kind of a visceral reaction to me, especially the first week. I've been at home full time for about 10 working days now. And uh, I think I felt like at the end of the day, my engine was running hot. I think I've talked to a lot of colleagues who felt that, like uh, the, the calendar looks kind of the same, same meeting cadence and maybe a few more one-on-ones, but just exhausted at the end of the day. And one of my realizations was my engine was running a little bit hot just because I was um, now having to use tools and I was working harder to interpret communication uh, that otherwise kind of came naturally to me. I was lacking some channels. And so I do think it's important that we're mindful of it. And again, as leaders, uh, that as we understand uh, how we're receiving communication in a different way, we find ways to fill in those gaps and to, uh, to make sure that the people that we're communicating with have as much context as, as they need. Uh, last week, I was communicating with one of our consultants. And like you, I was... I like I like that analogy engine running hot. I was I was getting kind of tired throughout that day. I was everything part of that of course is everything's changing so quickly and our our human brains aren't haven't evolved for that, you know. So I was right. kind of still in the process of of acclimating, but I was working really hard to kind of de- get everything done and I needed to communicate with one of our consultants and it was one of those really kind of this classic situation where my message to her in my mind was extremely encouraging. Like that's what I was trying to communicate. And I typed out this email to her. I did not go back and reread it because I'm so brilliant and I don't need to reread my emails. And, and then I sent it off to her and then, you know, and, and I, well, well, two days later we had a conversation and it was, she and in, she interpreted it as absolutely sort of condescending actually. And oh, wow. she was, awesome enough for her to be able to, you know, we, I think in our consulting team, we really do practice authenticity and it's, it, it's, it, we, we all have permission to, to say what's true for us and, and fix, uh, you know, interpersonal issues as they come up. And she was, um, you know, brave enough to call me up and say, Hey, this is the way I interpreted that. Is that, is that what you meant? I went back and I read the email and oh my gosh, it was so condescending. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't in my, you know, I wasn't feeling that way. That was absolutely not what was inside of me. And right. it was, it just is the words I chose. And not only if I would have reread that, I think it would, well, I, I, I know I would have caught it, but I also think that should have just been a phone conversation. You know, I, I was right. in that sort of expedient mode of it's so much easier to type an email because I can kind of multitask and, now, you know, so I save myself time, but then how much time do I really save, you know, when I have to go back and now do repair and right. make things right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that uh, spurs a couple of things. Number one, I, I love a, a culture that you have, even within your own firm, where um, someone felt comfortable to just communicate back directly and ask for clarification. Uh, I don't know that that exists in every organization, but it's healthy. And uh, I think that all the more in a completely virtual environment that we're going to be in for a while here, I think there has to be an encouragement uh, from from uh, leaders uh, to encourage that kind of direct communication between peers and to themselves. And the only way that that really works is if there's, there's no uh, uh, adverse consequence to that kind of communication. Exactly. Leaders have to be willing to accept it. And then you can kind of uh, eliminate the friction, kind of open up the pipeline, if you will, of communication, which is more important than ever for people to feel free uh, to get clarification on context and, and things. So that's that's the one, you know, one of the, the things that I react to in that in a, in a really positive way. You know, the other is uh, how wrapped around the axle we can get uh, with email communication, even in the best of days, uh, typically as a manager or a, a leader, I'll watch a reply, all communication go through about two, <laughs> two emails and before I call a huddle, before we get people mm-hmm. together. And uh, did that uh, just recently, uh, it had gone on five or six times and we have to rely a bit more on email communication when you can't just go to someone's office or cubicle. And so even more email is important. We can't always get on the phone or uh, communicate in that way. And, uh, and we, we called a huddle and we, we brought everyone together and, uh, 
you know, address the issue. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it hadn't become a, an adverse issue yet, but you could feel it kind of starting to escalate. So all the more, I think we have to uh, just kind of reset new patterns, uh, readdress best practices, make sure that we're communicating directly with uh, whenever possible. Oh, I love that. I, and I love the flexibility to just stop and make that happen and, and kind of head the problem off at the pass. That's, right. that's really good. And the first thing you said, I just, just listeners, you know, stay tuned, I guess. I, I, I really do want to spend some time in this podcast talking about that culture of authenticity and the culture of feedback and how to build that. And I think right now in this time of transition and, and remote managing, um, you know, if we haven't already built that culture, it's, it's a little more challenging to build it, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't, you know, it, 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 it it's not too late to talk to your team about, look, we, especially as we're going through change, we have to have the freedom to be able to say what needs to be said. And you as the manager, you have the power differential. You're the one that needs to give permission. You know, you're the one that needs to make it exceedingly clear to your people that there's no consequence for giving me feedback. There's no consequence for pointing out a problem. In fact, if, if anything, you should be rewarded for that. Mm -hmm. That's really right. I agree. Well, let's transition. Um, I, uh, communication in the context now of information distribution, generally speaking, uh, this is a really obvious question, Eric, but can we, can we just sort of both agree that this is a morale issue? <laughs> I totally agree. No argument there. Yeah, say more about that. The, 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 how, is, how, does, uh, how does information distribution connect with employee morale, in your opinion? <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, I think there are a couple of things, and this is where I mean, it certainly uh, is relevant to the whole virtual working and some of the current circumstances we have. But I think your question is more broadly. It really is a um, a, a very important thing in terms of culture and, and employee mor morale. There are a couple of things. Number one. Um, employees don't want to be patronized, mm -hmm. um, you know. People that uh, report to you that are in a broader organization um, need context. They need the broader story. And just kind of isolated, specialized messages that lack context uh, are really difficult to have. And they can um, suppress uh, morale and, um, and inhibit you know, momentum and, and culture building within an organization. So I just think it's really important to provide a, a broad kind of context to communication. I think that um, also part of culture is this uh, organizations can get really stuck in hierarchy. And so senior managers uh, have kind of an exclusive domain that they m might operate in and, and communication is filtered out and repackaged and distributed uh, down the line. Sometimes when there's proprietary information or extraneous information, um, you can't just cascade information in whole part. But one of my guiding principles and what I've learned from my own mentors and managers is whenever possible uh, to, to cascade information in whole part in ways that provide the context that you receive. I think it, it um, provides context and it also just builds a culture of inclusion. I, I, I just want to interrupt you there, Eric. That's, that's really, really good. I, have you heard of that? It's that's kind of snarky phrase, that, that mushroom management, that concept? I haven't heard. It, you keep, keep, keep people in the dark and feed them bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I, I, what, what you're saying uh, rings true to me in, in several ways. And, I, and part of that is uh, one of the reasons I think that this impacts morale is that when you feel like you're only getting, quote, all you need to know, or, or I'm sorry, let's start over that. What's that phrase? Um, need to know. Okay. Yeah. You know, when you, as an employee, when you're, when you're kind of in the need to know and you're just getting a little bit of information trickled down to you, um, I, I think it. I think it gives you not only that sense of being one down and not very important. You also start to feel sort of like a you know like a chess piece in someone else's game. Right. Like like just do what I'm telling you to do and don't ask why kind of thing. And I can't imagine that could even come close to leading to any kind of investment or ownership or sense of um, buy-in. You know from that employee. Exactly. And then la also there's the roadblocks. Right. I mean I, if I don't have enough information. As an employee, I can't make the right decisions when something goes sideways. I can't adjust. I can't, you know, I can't be flexible because I don't have enough information. And so now I'm running into roadblocks, which means I'm going to feel like a failure or I'm not going to feel successful. And that impacts my morale. I totally agree with that. I think that's uh, an even uh, more insightful way of, of, you know, communicating what I, what I was describing. Um, really important to, uh, to, to morale. 
Yeah, any other thoughts on that, on morale and communication and how those connect? Yeah, and I, I think that there's a, a symbiotic relationship to having employees participate or receive communication uh, at layers of the organization where they can get as much context as possible. One thing is when you cascade an inf- uh, information like that, or if you include employees in a decision-making forum that they might have otherwise in a more hierarchical organization be excluded from, if you can bring them in appropriately, allow them to hear the information firsthand, to participate in decision-making uh, that's, that's appropriate, um, it, reduces, it also reduces the strain on the leader themselves to figure out how to ca- cascade communication. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know I've spent my, I'm talking about best practices, but I've spent an entire career uh, trying to get out of my own way and adopting best practices that don't always come naturally. I think as leaders, we've always found ourselves in that moment of, it's been a long time since I've really briefed the team, or we missed that last interval on our staff meeting, and you extend the duration of actually providing information, it's not a good feeling. And so I speak uh, from some humility here. But again, I've had the benefit of learning from some really great uh, leaders about um, how to fill those gaps and how to create context and empowerment. I think when uh, when teammates, when uh, direct reports or participate in meetings where they can be part of a larger forum, it's empowering. And, and that's what really what we need as leaders. Uh, that's really good. And I, I'm going to steal your phrase about, you know, getting out of our own way as managers and as leaders. That's, that's, I have a rich history of sometimes not getting out of my own way. That's, that's, that's really good. I, you, you, you bring up decision-making and I, you know, we're, we're kind of going sideways on this, but I just, it's so important. And, and we're going to be spending another couple of podcasts on this in the future, but I love what you just said about people participating in those decisions. It's, it's another form of information distribution to actually go to your your group, your team, and say, hey, I'm, um, I need to make a decision about X, Y, and Z. Uh, g- give me your thoughts and ideas. Help, help me make this decision. And, and one of the things we'll be talking about in the future podcast is, you know, employees just want to know if they're influencing or deciding. You just want to be really clear with them. And so when I say to my employees, uh, hey, you know, I need to make this decision. Give me your thoughts and ideas. I haven't given them the decision, right? I haven't, uh, it hasn't become a consensus at that point. I'm actually asking for data and for help and for ideas. And I'm going to take all that and I'm going to create something. I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to come back and circle back and let them know what I've decided and how their input was helpful versus just as effective in a different context would be, no, let's make this decision together. Let's, let, let's go ahead and do a consensus this time. And so we'll be talking about those different ways of deciding, but I'm really glad you brought that up because that really is another form of information distribution. So Eric, we've already alluded to this today, but what are, and now that we've sort of established that communication and involving employees in decisions, communication, et cetera, is so important for morale. It's pretty obvious, but what are the roadblocks in the remote world? What, what are the challenges to information distribution in the remote world? Yeah, we've talked about uh, the, the context, the need for kind of to, to interpret tone and, and to fill in gaps for some of the nonverbal uh, communication. I think one thing that organizations are working through right now is just the technology itself. And this is where uh, our CEO, Tom Troy, has done a brilliant job. Even as we'd gone through uh, multiple meetings as a leadership team on things like disaster preparedness and, and cascading communication through the organization, critical decisions about whether to keep an office open or not. Uh, you've got a lot of times 10 to 20 people on the phone, our, our risk team and the executive leadership team. Uh, Tom's done a, f- a brilliant job of managing that communication using tools uh, in in terms of chat function and kind of directing traffic, making sure that people get heard. and uh, I think so. It's it's really important. The tech, if the technology gets in your way, it's really tough to do business. Yes. Yeah, I agree so. with that. I, I think another challenge is you know in in a face to face situation when everybody's in the office at the same time, communication can be a little bit more random, right? Like not as programmed, yeah. not as planned. As you mentioned earlier, you just pop in and you know you just have these different conversations throughout the day. I think that the challenge in the remote world is you're 
you're, that's just not happening. And so everything has to be more intentional. And if you're not careful, it can start to feel almost intrusive, right? Because we haven't actually set up anything. We haven't really planned our communication. So it's just sort of random calls and texts and emails. And it can actually cause you to feel uh, disorganized and scattered. And, um, you know, I think we're kind of jumping into maybe some, some strategies here. But one of the things that I really suggest to managers is that you actually talk with your employees and I would start with maybe uh, individual employees one-on-one because you're going to have different roles and different duties and different tasks and create a, uh, a stay at home action plan or a communication action plan. Like, like what are you and I going to do to stay in contact? For example, um, let's make sure we have a phone call every Monday morning at nine o'clock and let's, let's talk about our week and let's talk about, you know, what you're doing and what you need from me. And, uh, let's maybe have a check-in on Wednesdays and let's have one more call maybe on Fridays. That doesn't mean that I'm not still available. I, you know, I still have my quote open door policy, you know, let's talk about how we're going to reach each other, you know, in the in-between times. But I guess one of my suggestions is because, especially if the remote situation is brand new for you, do a little bit more planning and be a little bit more intentional about how you're going to stay in contact. Yeah, I really agree with that. Um, you know, with my staff, we have set one-on-one meetings uh, every week. Um, but I think that um, there's been a need to close the intervals, uh, you know, even more than that. And um, one of the things I don't know, Mike, if you've uh, seen in your own career or if the, the people that uh, your clients that you work with uh, have seen, but we've developed kind of different social courtesies a lot of times around even phone calls that instead of just picking up the phone and calling someone on the cold, uh, either set a brief Outlook meeting or uh, somehow give them a heads up that we'll call. We've certainly, I've certainly seen that in, in my world. I think the use of technology can also um, allow us to continue some of those courtesies in efficient ways. And so we use instant message a lot uh, to, uh, you know, signal to someone, are you, you available for a brief phone call or uh, to communicate that way, even by uh, instant message and then hit Skype or whatever technology you use to get on the phone together. Uh, I think that um, the one-on-one meetings are absolutely important, as you point out, and, and um, to have structure around those, but also to just use uh, the technology that we have in even more clever ways. I've found that instant message and some of those uh, on-the-fly kind of Skype calls really do substitute for that um, uh, stepping into someone's office or meeting them in the hallway uh, that we're missing now in the uh, face-to-face work environment. This is going to seem really redundant because I, I don't want to just say what you just said, Eric, but I, you're actually, lights are going on for me as you as you say that. I, I so So again, there might be the established times that we already know we have this meeting planned so we just show up you know through zoom or skype or whatever you're getting at how to use the open door policy or the you know drop by in the office thing and i really like that because i i didn't think of it until you just said that the idea that it can it actually can be a bit distracting and and take me off my game when i get these calls and right. i've and or i call someone else and suddenly i i need their attention but they're right in the middle of something else i love that idea of of sending a text first or an email or whatever and saying, hey, can we get together? Can we talk sometime in the next half hour? I, I, I love that. That's really good. Great. Yeah, it has worked. And I, sh- I know that I appreciate it as well. I'm kind of like you. Um, our schedules get so structured mm-hmm. that if I do get a call that hasn't been planned on my calendar, uh, it seems ridiculous. We should all be able to call each other whenever. But I do think we've adopted these kind of social norms that, uh, that there is this kind of professional courtesy. And so uh, it, it, it's helped us uh, to... to um, leverage some of those and uh, make sure that we stay in, in contact uh, even more. You know, one other thing we've done just in terms of kind of culture building, last Friday afternoon, we had a late staff meeting. It just kind of kept getting pushed to the end of the week, but it en- ended up at 4 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, and we were exhausted from all the things we've been talking about, just the, just the, the intensity of the week, both uh, socially, just personally, professionally, and the different patterns. And so we declared that this was our happy hour staff meeting. We, we said we're virtually going down the street to Hops and Scotch, which is the place where we would see a retiree off or uh, have a, a notable celebration. 
and uh, the kind of relief in the room was palpable. Um, people really did uh, respond to that. So I think there are ways to structure, whether it's one-on-one staff meetings to make sure that we're getting business done and people have the dignity of, look, we're still about business. But I think also it's important to, be, to invest in the cultural uh, relational part of our, our work too. That's, that's brilliant. I, I, was, I was actually literally about to ask you that question. So let's just do it. How do you maintain a sense of team? And, and I, what you just described is such a great option is just to have some fun, right? Have a happy hour, have a, a time where you're not even going to be talking about business, but you're just going to be together anyways. I think it'd be easy to skip that um, yeah. because we're feeling busy and lots to do. And, you know, I, I think to be intentional about making sure you don't skip that, because I think one of the things we right. might risk losing in we in the virtual office is camaraderie and teaming and a sense of connection. Right. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think it happens in, in group, group meetings, but one-on-ones as well. We, I think when, when people have the the opportunity to work from home and it's something that they want to do and then in a normal environment i think there's a real imperative to make sure that that we maintain a professional surrounding and uh, that that we don't have dogs barking in the background and and other things going on uh senior leaders and and just companies in general can have uh can have really understandable and and uh, acceptable standards around those kind of things particularly if you're interacting with clients and and uh, other forums in the current environment, uh, each one of my employees has kids at home and yeah. a spouse that's doing their own job. You can often hear them on their own conference calls. And so I think there's an opportunity, especially when you hear a dog bark or a, a toddler kind of peeks into the camera view in a Zoom call, uh, to just acknowledge that. And um, I've, I've even had the opportunity to interact with a couple of the toddlers this last week. <laughs> I delight in that personally. Uh, but whether that's your thing or not, I think there's an opportunity to just acknowledge the personal situation that each of us find ourselves in and affirm it and follow that thread as far as it's appropriate to to understand what's going on in the, the environment around and let go of some of those other controls that we might have in another circumstance. I think it's another way to build uh, relationships and, and, uh, and culture. Dude, you're not a dumb guy. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. I, it's funny because that, what that fits with is the concept of, you know, you're not trying to take your in-person office situation and then absolutely replicate it in the remote world. Exactly. It's, it's, it's not yeah. the same thing. And I think we do that at our peril when we think, okay, we're going to try to make this exactly the same, although it's long distance. Exactly. And what you're getting at here is, no, let's, let's kind of roll with it, right? Let's acknowledge that things are different. And boy, talk about work-life balance, you know, talk about the opportunity to help uh, even, you know, to promote that idea or to promote that, um, that value that we have, that you are a whole person. You're not just a cog in my system. You're not just my employee. You have a life. I have a life, you know, it's, it's kind of a built-in way to acknowledge that. I love right. it. I think that's great. Good. Thanks, Mike. Other thoughts or ideas uh, in general regarding uh, information distribution in the remote world, uh, making sure we keep our employees in the loop and informed, um, maybe the cadence or the style by which we connect with our employees. Any other thoughts on that, Eric? Yeah, I have to go back to um, just a tip of the hat. I've said several times in our conversation today um, how grateful I am for the, the models and mentors that I've had. Yes. And I would say that the best – the best communicator I've ever been around just in a corporate setting is a, is a, a guy named Mike Hughes. He was a former senior executive at the Hartford. I worked with him at Safeco and Liberty Mutual. He's now retired. But Mike was an absolutely brilliant communicator in that way. And I, I can't tell you how many end of the day, six o'clock, uh, you know, leaving the office, Mike was standing in his office dictating uh, all the uh, notes, bullet point notes from the day's meetings. Um, his executive assistant is a little bit old school, but his executive assistant would transcribe those notes and we would have bullet point notes from the meetings Mike had gone to um, from the previous day in our inbox. They were digestible. They were between six and 10 uh, bullet points. It was uh, incisive, concise way that we could ingest those. Oftentimes I cascaded them to my own teams. It was a tremendous gift to me to have that communication packaged. But it answered the question for me, what in the world do senior leaders do all day? Mike answered that question every day. And I think as leaders, oftentimes, um, we 
we need to be able to answer that question for our own employees. I think we've all been at points in our career where we ask that question. And I think as leaders, we owe that answer to our employees. And if we aren't summarizing and cascading communication in some ways, I think it's. I think we we leave a tremendous uh, gap of information, but also just the culture that we want to build. One of the best practices I've adopted uh, is since I don't dictate, uh, is to open up a blank email during a teleconference and type bullet point notes during that teleconference that I can cascade immediately to my team. And so many times. I'll finish up a teleconference and hit send on that email, and my employees have prepackaged kind of bullet point notes in the Mike Hughes model, uh, and I don't uh, find myself two days later trying to remember exactly what happened in the meeting, or now it's kind of too far from the meeting to actually uh, rationalize sending something out. That is one way that I've found to be able to, uh, to cascade information and to ask that really important question that my employees should be asking, what in the world is Eric doing all day? That's great. I, I mentioned information curating at the beginning, beginning of this podcast. And um, when we're teaching on uh, information distribution in our Managing with Mind and Heart workshop, we talk about leaders, managers being information curators, which means they're collecting information to cascade down. And we talk about four sources of that information. And you've just really brilliantly described one of them, which is what we call your boss's bulleted list. We literally call it that in the training. Oh, wow. You know, huh. I'm, I'm cascading down my boss's bulleted list. Or, you know, yeah. He or she is cascading it to me, then I'm cascading it to whoever I need to bring that to. That's one of the things. Another thing would be my own information, of course, things that mm -hmm. I know I need to tell my team. Another one would be my stakeholders, you know, my, the people around me, my peers, and what's happening in their departments. I need to collect information from them that I can deliver then to my direct reports. And the fourth category would be what we call the rain of emails, right? Like, like we're getting right. all these emails from HR and from, you know, all these different parts of the organization. As a manager, I don't want to just assume that everybody's reading those and getting those and, you know, uh, assimilating all that stuff. I'm going to mention some of that as well in my communication to my direct reports. So I, right. I, so I really like the way you describe that kind of in real time, how that might show up in a, you know, in a phone call or right after a meeting. That's, that's really great. Yeah, thanks. One more thing, Eric, you, you had said a few things there about your happy hour and your group and your team. And I just want to kind of throw out a general question again about in the remote world, how do we maintain a sense of team? How do we, remain, how do, how do we maintain a sense of connection and alignment? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, we oftentimes think of team as that immediate team around us and, you know, almost like a football huddle. You have the, the immediate players around us. That's our team. I think in, in the current circumstance, we have to, you know, maybe rethink about what the team is. And um, uh, particularly in large dispersed organizations, I happen to be right now managing a highly matrixed kind of dispersed uh, organization that's essentially building a company from the ground up. And there are people in different time zones and cities. There are people in different functions. And oftentimes, you know, we'll focus on the team that's immediate, immediately around us uh, to the exclusion of some people that uh, are also in need to be a part of the, the broader story and group. And so we've been mindful of, of that too. I think uh, through stops and starts and learning hard lessons and maybe failing in certain ways, we're really de redoubling our focus on making sure that we, we cast a wide net, particularly during this period of time. A couple of things that we're doing, I mean, one is um, I am writing kind of brief one page summaries uh, of just key decisions that are being made in the broad kind of program and making sure that I cascade those down to the organization so people understand the business context, even if they're a software engineer, if they're program programming some technology, they, they understand the, the overarching story, the business context. Um, you know, and another is to um, have large group forums. One of the uh, great things about the technology we use is uh, that we can get a lot of people on the phone. You don't want a large group, certainly in every meeting, but there are certain intervals at, you know, monthly where we can have almost an open line um, to be able to kind of refresh the story, uh, refresh where we are at our, in our uh, development and program to open up the line for communication, use technology for written or chat questions, and make sure that people understand that they're not only part of their local teams, their small teams, their direct reporting teams, but they're also part of a, a larger effort. Uh, those are the kind of things that we're paying attention to right now. 
Wow, that's great. I, you know, what a great segue. I, I want to do a little shameless self promotion here. Um, r- managing remotely is an art. Uh, well, let me start over. Managing is an art in and, in and of itself, right? And and now we're we're adding the the extra barriers and challenges and opportunities of of managing remotely. Uh, we have created a uh, virtual workshop called Managing Remotely with Mind and Heart. Um, it's a, it's, it's, it's uh, similar to our Managing with Mind and Heart concept, uh, many of the same ideas and techniques and skills, but we've morphed it into, again, the art of managing remotely. And I would just encourage our listeners, if you are now finding yourself in a situation where you're managing people outside the office in a remote setting, you may want to sign up or, or ask us to come in and, and train your managers. It's, it's, a, it's a really quick three-hour virtual training that will just give you some of the best practices for managing remotely. We also have a two-hour remote training that's about how to have a really good remote meeting. And I think that's a, a good, uh, maybe, a, maybe stack those two things together. It could be a really good program for your managers. If you're interested in having us come in uh, virtually and work with your managers in that way, you can give us a call. We're at 509-630-630. 0841. Um, other ways to contact us, of course, would be just be go, just go on our website, uh, Nash, www.nashconsulting.com, and you can get a hold of us there. Uh, I'd also like to make it um, uh, make our newsletter available to everybody. Uh, once a month, we put out a newsletter that uh, includes our offerings as far as trainings and workshops. There's some cool things in there that we've been reading. There's management tips. Um, if you're interested in that, you can sign up through our website or you can text the word leading, L-E-A-D-I-N-G, to 66866. Mm-hmm. Let me say that again. Text leading to 66866. Hey, Eric, this has been um, really fun for me, and I actually learned some things, and I I think that some of the things you said here today are going to make it into our new workshop, actually. Um, You've given me some great ideas for staying connected and staying consistent and building team. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom. Well, Mike, it was a pleasure. It was great to talk to you again after all these years. And uh, you gave me the opportunity to reflect on some of these things. So thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Eric, so much. And to our listeners, thank you again for tuning in. And same time, same bat channel for future podcasts around managing remotely, managing in general. Management is an art. And it's something that all of us can learn and all of us can continue to excel in and grow in. Thanks for tuning in.